Hello, welcome to tonight's virtual Civil War presentation brought to you by CivilWarTalk.com. Our guest tonight is Janet Elizabeth Kroon, and she will be speaking about her book, The War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860 to 1865 published by Savas Beatty in 2018 and winner of the 2018 Douglas Southall Freeman Award. This series is brought to you by CivilWarTalk.com, the American Civil War Discussion Forum. We're pleased to be able to bring these programs to you via the live virtual platform. If you aren't already a member of Civil War Talk, we will be providing membership information later in the program. I hope everyone will join and become a member of the Civil War Talk community. Tina? Oh, sorry. I was, I thought um, there was a section there for Mike. Okay, I'm sorry. Our guest tonight is Janet Elizabeth Kroon. Ms. Kroon holds a bachelor's degree in political science modern European history and Russian language and area studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, 1983, and a master's degree in international studies from the University of Dayton, 1985. She has been teaching international baccalaureate history for nearly two decades and developed a keen interest in the Civil War by living in Northern Virginia. Leroy Wiley Gresham's diary is the only known Civil War diary of a male teenage non-combatant and is lauded by the Library of Congress as one of its premier holdings. It is published here for the first time in The War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860-1865, with helpful footnotes and annotations by the editor. This is Ms. Kroon's first book and it is the winner of the 2018 Douglas Southall Freeman Award. Please join me in welcoming Janet Elizabeth Kroon. Thank you. Okay, let me get the screen up. There we go. Does everybody see the screen? See the presentation? Okay, awesome. Um, this is Leroy right here. He is, um, we think about 10, 11 years old in this picture, maybe a little bit younger. And it's the only image that we have of him um, to date. Things keep popping up. We keep finding interesting new bits of information. But this is our little Leroy. Um, and I wanted to show in the beginning in the, um, a screenshot of the diaries just so you can see his handwriting, which was absolutely gorgeous to read. Um, it's done in a mixture of pencil and pen. Um, and it's, it was just a delight to work through. Um, I, again, t after teaching high school, reading such lovely handwriting in cursive was a joy. <laughs> so I really en enjoyed reading through it. Um, let's see. Let me move forward. There we go. So the diaries themselves, um, Leroy's diary was featured in a Washington Post article um, about the sesquicentennial celebration um, and presentation that the Library of Congress put together. Um, they call this book a gem in their collection, and it's, it's part of a greater holding. Um, it was donated by Leroy's sister's descendants, and it includes letters from um, an even larger family. This is actually just a really small part of it, but an important one. Uh, Leroy was born to a prominent slave holding family in Macon, Georgia. His father had already been mayor of Macon on two, for two terms. Macon elected their mayor every, every year at that point. Um, he was a, um, a businessman had been a lawyer, but didn't care for law. He had been, uh, he's also very prominent in the Presbyterian church. And he, Leroy writes about all of this in his, his diary. Um, again, he started it at the age of 12 in 1860 in the summer. And it ends um, about 
two months or so after the uh, after Appomattox. And again, a unique point of this diary is he writes almost every single day. Once the war itself gets going, he only misses maybe four or five days out of the entire war. So you get a very, very complete look at the life in the household, his life, um, his community, and in the Confederacy in general. Leroy was an invalid. He was, he was a sick little kid, but he is incredibly smart, well-educated, kind, curious, and on occasion, extremely opinionated. Um, finding out what had happened to Leroy and why he was in the condition he was in was part of the, um, the sleuthing that we had to do, that I had to do to um, get this book complete. Um, I needed to figure out who all the different individuals that he talks about in there. Um, the Ancestry.com family tree for the Greshams that I have has 1,702 individuals. I still can't place the three cousins from Alabama. Um, I have to go back and do some more searching for that. I needed to find out where the plantation um, holdings were located and how he got sick. Um, these are his parents later in life, Mary Eliza Baxter um, and John Jones Gresham. Okay. And these were taken on the porch of the home that John Gresham built on College Street in Macon. And what's really fun is I have sat in that exact same spot. It is now a um, uh, bed and breakfast. It's called the 1842 Inn. And you can go and stay there. And uh, the people who run the 1842 are very, very welcoming to Leroy's readers. Um, they enjoy showing them around the house. And it's just it's a beautiful place. Um, one sec. Gresham owned about 100 slaves on two plantations south and east of Macon in what is, I later found out was called Houston County. It's not Houston. <laughs> um, I got help from the University of Georgia map library and um, the ladies laughed and they go, you're not from around here, are you? And I said, no. <laughs> so it's Houston County. And um, they called the two places, they were side by side next to each other. They called them Oakwood and Pinelands. And um, the last time I was in Macon doing a presentation, somebody came up to me and I said, I think you mean the, the, the place that, excuse my cat, <laughs> I think you're talking about a place we call Oakie, Oakie Woods. So it, it still exists. It's not um, developed. There's an Air Force base nearby. So I kind of wondered if the base had encroached on the, on the area. It's undeveloped. And one day we're hoping to get some archeologists in there to take a look and see if we can find information about what the plantation life was like. Um, this next picture, um, is a really rare hand-colored daguerreotype. Um, we've been really fortunate, as I said, with lots of people being really generous with their family heirlooms. And a gentleman came to one of my presentations and showed me some pictures that they had. One of them was this. Now, there were actually two other women um, to the left of these two. But if you look at the faces of the young woman on the left and, the, and Mary, that we know is Mary, you can see the resemblance. And um, we believe, we like to believe that the lady she's sitting next to is her, grand, is her mother, uh, Mary Ann Baxter, uh, who is the only grandparent that the, the children had during the war. Um, I was able to get uh, the date of this as the late 1840s through some of my Facebook friends who do a lot of historical clothing. I posted the pictures in a clothes group. And I said, what can you guys tell me about this? And within 15 minutes, about 20 women had told me that it was the 1840s and then why it was the 1840s. And it's because of the collar 
the shape of the sleeves, um, the lace that comes down the low bodice. Um, it changes by the time the Civil War comes around. But that we believe that's Mary uh, about the time she would have had Leroy or he would have been an, a, a small infant. Um, he was, he seems to come across as a favored child in a very, very close family. And I'll discuss some of that as we go. But um, that picture itself is, it's really, really small and uh, quite, quite rare to see something hand colored that beautifully. Really was quite remarkable. But the picture here just doesn't do it justice. Um, these are also some of the pictures that the gentleman had. He's a descendant of John Gresham's older brother. Um, Thomas was the first of the children. He was born in 1844. And um, Thomas and Leroy were really extremely close. Um, they're three years apart in age, but they had a common language that the only they two could understand. Now that's not uncommon in twins, but it's extremely rare in kids three years apart. Um, his mother writes about the fact that they, they could talk and understand each other and nobody else could. Um, when Thomas went off to college, Leroy was really at a loss because he was extremely close to his brother. Um, and he, he wrote about this picture, um, which I'd been trying to find a picture um, at a couple different libraries I called and thought, maybe if I talk to a different librarian, maybe somebody's just not wanting to go look. But um, this, the, this gentleman had this box and this is Thomas's image that Leroy writes about in January of 1864. Thomas is 20 years old and he is about to go off into the war. Um, Minnie was the only daughter, it's Mary, but they called her Minnie. Yes, she's a mini me because of, you know, her mom's name is Mary. Um, she was exceptionally well educated. She went to the all girls um, Wesleyan, Wesleyan Female College um, after she gra um, graduated from the, the uh, private school the kids all went to. Um, and that was her first college um, experience. After the war, um, and she graduated as a co-valedictorian, she and her cousin went to um, Baltimore and got a m more university education. And um, that's where she met her husband, and that is where they settled. Um, both Minnie and Thomas are uh, laid to rest in Baltimore. The rest of the family is in uh, Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon, which is a really unique place. I've not been to Baltimore to go and see their graves, but I will, I will get there. They had two other siblings that died uh, very young in life. Edmund was seven months old. And again, this gentleman had a treasure trove of, for us um, because he was a descendant of Edmund. Thomas had written a, a letter to his brother Edmund saying his little namesake had died of complications of pneumonia at seven, seven months. Um, Edward was born after Leroy. He lived 17 months. And we do have a lot of um, extant letters. Um, Ted has some of them in his, Ted Savas, my publisher, has some in his computer. Um, some are still on the um, Library of Congress website and haven't been able to go through all of those quite yet uh, to find out any information about Edward. Um, Leroy doesn't mention either of the boys uh, in his writings. Um, but why the diary? And I found in, a, in a, a, a memoir written by a man who was uh, same age as Leroy, whose name was Judge Ayers. He wrote about an instance when he was a child um, at Mr. Bates's school, which is where all the Gresham kids went, it's across the street, actually. Um, there had been a building named the Washington Building in downtown Macon. It was part of the business part of town. It, it, there's a, um, it's on a hill going down toward the Okmulgee River. And um, it was closer to that. And all the, the houses were up on a bluff. They could get the better air that way, being up on top of the hill. 
And so they found out that the Washington building had burned and decided they were gonna go and um, investigate and see what had happened. And Judge Ayers wrote that while they were in there poking around, he noticed that the only thing left standing, which was the brick chimney, was starting to wobble. And so somebody called out for everybody to, to run and the little boy next to him, he wrote, was caught, he caught the worst of it. And he said his, his left leg was crushed. He was never able to walk again and he died shortly after the war. And that's Leroy. Um, he had a problem with his left leg, started off with his left leg. He was not able to walk by the time he's writing and he died shortly after the war. So we, I was able to find out with some research what exactly happened to him. Um, he was able to get around town in a wagon that was pulled by um, a slave that they had brought up from the plantations to be a companion for Leroy. Um, some of his friends would pull him around or Thomas if he wanted to go somewhere in town. Minnie tried once that Leroy writes about Minnie trying to pull him in it ended up being not so good because she fell over. She was much littler, I guess. Um, as he's um, writing, he develops a cough and eventually back abscesses. The author who wrote the original article that I saw on Facebook that clued me in on, on these books, he thought they were bed sores, but they were actually abscesses on his back, part of his disease process. And he wrote, got the journey, the, the diary, which you can see the opening page here, um, is when he and his father, just the two of them, made a journey to Philadelphia to see a surgeon named Dr. Joseph Pancoast. I researched him and he was one of the first doctors in the US to practice what we now call plastic surgery reconstructive surgery. Um, so he was the top of the line in the US. And John took his son to go and see this doctor to see if this doctor could, could help Leroy in any way. Um, the diary was a gift from his mother so Leroy could write about all the things that happened. He starts writing out like a normal 12 year old. Um, his sentences are complete, but they're generally, they're choppy. We saw flying fish. Not all the ladies on board the ship are sick. Um, so it's, it's typical for a 12 year old. His writing doesn't get really uh, more, com more complex, uh, more sophisticated for about another year or so. But when it does, it goes off the charts. And as uh, teachers, you know, when we're reading things by students, so I can tell he's mostly a, a normal 12 year old. Um, his education, he's self-educated mostly. It shows in his writing and he is, by the time he's um, 14 or so, he's, he's, his thought process is really um, well developed and his writing has gotten very, very good. So um, I would have loved to have had this kid in my classroom, is what I can say. Um, so his personality, he is, uh, like as I said, educated. He read everything. He loved math. He adored chess. And he likes science in general. Um, he's reading um, Shakespeare for fun. I can't imagine my students doing that. Um, he read, um, he was in the middle of reading Les Miserables by uh, Victor Hugo, which came out in serialized form. So you would get one section and then the other, next section would come out a little bit later. It's kind of like me having to wait for the next season of Outlander. Uh, and when the last one came out, he was very excited to read that. Um, math, he ended up um, doing mathematics that were complex enough that only his brother and one other young man in town um, um, were able to help him with math and they would send math problems across town to each other. So I can see some of the servants running from house to house with scary math on paper. Um, <laughs> And uh, he kept track of basically astronomy was one of his things. And he writes about the, the um, eclipses. He writes about um, 
you know, the sh different uh, phases of the moon and things like that. Um, he's inquisitive. He wants to know things. Um, he's sweet. He's funny. He, um, he's kind to people. There's no sibling rivalry, apparently, in this family. Um, I have one brother, and we still kind of have sibling rivalry. Um, not too much so anymore, but um, there, he gets along and adores his, his older brother and younger sister. He loved pets, and he had a whole series of dogs named after Confederate generals. Um, they had one cat. You can hear the bell on my cat in the background. Um, he had a, a, a baby deer at one point and a rabbit. Cat got the rabbit. Uh, so you hear all these stories um, about the animals, and he seemed to have a good relationship with everyone. He doesn't talk badly about the people in his everyday life. He just doesn't, uh, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, he's opinionated about especially politics and um, the war itself. And um, especially as he gets later, he develops his own opinions on things. Um, the photograph I showed you of Thomas, he considered to be a total failure. And I thought, I don't, I didn't understand that he's a kind of nice looking young man. He's 20 years old. But I think it was a Thomas he didn't recognize. Thomas was a happy-go-lucky kid. He was the one who was um, up on the roof at grandmother's house in Athens, Georgia, putting pebbles down the rain spout, which nobody appreciated. Um, always getting into things, uh, shooting robins in the yard. But in that picture was a serious young man who's contemplating going off to a war that has already claimed the lives of uh, many friends. Um, so he didn't care for that picture at all. And the entries often include tw Mark Twain-like witty phrases. Um, this is one of the amusing ones that I clipped out um, to show you. Um, it's from January 24th, 1862. And you see like toddler scribbles on there. And above it, he writes, some jackass got hold of this book and tried his hand at writing. So he's, you know, saying, okay, somebody got a hold of my book. And there's only two people in the household that it could possibly be. One was um, a little girl named Florence, who would have been about five years old. And she was the daughter of one of the um, slaves who worked in the household. And Florence, probably at five, would have known to not touch Leroy's book. It seemed like he had it always with him. The other one was his cousin, Tracy. And Tracy was the son of um, one of his mother's brothers, um, Dr. Uh, John Springs Baxter. He was um, a surgeon um, for Georgia in the Confederate Army. Um, and his mother died when he was about a year old. So at this point, uh, Tracy would have been about two. And two-year-olds would have written like that, too. So we think it was probably Tracy. But it's just little things like that. Um, he talks about getting very excited at one point reading in the newspaper. And he saw um, Dr. Pankos' name. And he talks about Pankos on occasion throughout the book. And he said he was very, very excited to see that Dr. Pankos was, um, was busy. He was the uh, personal physician for um, one of the, the generals in the army. And he, he said he was excited to see his name. And in parentheses, he goes, Dr. Pankos, not General Carney. So he made that very, very clear. He wasn't excited about General Carney. Um, you learn a lot about their social life and the life of the community in general. And it provides, the diary gives you a really unique view of Southern family life for the upper classes in the 19th century. Now, um, in the introduction, they mentioned this is the only diary written by a young man. There's, there's several written by women um, or girls, but they're not very complete. Many of them are rural. Um, so you get a good view of that kind of life out in the countryside. Um, there's one in particular that, that's interesting. It's by Annie Froebel. Um, who was the sister of Thomas's eventual commander in the war. I thought the personal connections were just 
unique here. But this is kind of an urban one. And he talks about all the changes in town, how the, parade, the fairgrounds were turned into parade grounds for training. All the different units that came through Macon, Macon being a, a railroad crossroads. Um, so a lot of them would come into Macon and you would talk about going out to the, the, um, the fairgrounds to watch them drill. And that eventually was turned into a um, union off officer prisoner of war camp. So you see all that transition just in the city itself as he writes. He describes the food, the different conversations, the interactions, the clothing. And the stream of visitors is, is extraordinary. I'm not going to spoil it for you by telling you everybody who comes through, because that wouldn't be good. But there, there was uh, one footnote I put in. I, I was personally very excited about it. And Ted, my publisher, was like, why do we need this? And I said, well, um, the Reverend Thomas um, Wilson came to the house, one of the Presbyteries, the annual meeting of Presbyterian elders, was in the house. He goes, well, who's that? I said, oh, it's Woodrow Wilson's father. He was a, a minister in Georgia, and he was in the home, as was Woodrow Wilson's first wife's grandfather, Reverend Axon. And the two of them, those two ministers, married the Wilsons in um, Savannah. And he goes, okay, I guess you can leave that leave that one because it shows that this family is is prominent in the past is prominent in the present and it's going to still be prominent in the future um so um the dresses are are interesting he talks about um many learning to knit he keeps track of how many pairs of socks she has knit he writes about her uh wearing her first um um homespun dress not not a silk or anything like that that they would have normally used, but homespun. So when a girl of many social class starts wearing homespun, it's okay for everybody to be patriotic and wear homespun. So um, he follows them from the peak of their influence down to their the, the almost poverty that they have, the insecurity that the Greshams had at the end of the war. Um, there's one incident at the end where John Gresham is trying to get his son a nutritious meal and he has to barter for it with the family silver. Um, and they don't know if they're going to have a home to live in the following Christmas. So you can see the insecurity that followed these wealthy families as the war went on. Um, there's also a, a, a list of, and some minor biographies of people in Leroy's life. Um, they are he, the, the cream of the crop as far as the town goes. If you goes, go to Rose Hill and you drive in to find the Gresham plot, you see names of all the people he's writing about all through there, um, which is really interesting. Um, I also was able to figure out how, who belonged to which part of the family. I've divided it down by the, the different grandparents. Um, and there, I had to find out which, which was cousin Mary, which was aunt Mary, when there's like 57 women named Mary in the family three. Um, so that was, that was quite a chore. It was, it, was it was interesting though. It was a lot of fun to be able to put that together and, and find the obscure names, the nicknames that he was calling people and find out, okay, that's who that is. Um, so for genealogists, it was a lot of fun. Um, he's political, especially as secession happens. Um, he wrote a lot about Jefferson Davis. He thought the Davis Stevens ticket was, he called it a prime ticket. And it's not a wonder because Alex Stevens was one of the family friends in Athens. He knew grandmother well and occasionally would carry mail for her to and from Richmond. Um, he hated Joe Brown, who was the governor of Georgia. Governors at that point were elected every other year. Um, and he had already had two, um, two, he won two elections. 
Uh, when he won his third, Leroy thought that that was just not right. And it was a downright embarrassment when he won his fourth. Um, he notes Joe Brown and Jefferson Davis not getting along. He talks about, well, Jeff no, President Davis has called a uh, day of Thanksgiving on uh, um, April 28th. And uh, Governor Brown has said that in Georgia, we're going to do it on May 9th. So, I mean, it was crazy things like that. He picks up and he writes about, so you get a sense of the political personalities as he's going through this. Um, I already talked about this one. Um, he knew Jefferson Davis's history, uh, his eloquence in writing his speeches and like that. And Joe Brown, I, I just, just never liked him. He was young and like when I was teaching my ninth graders uh, during an election year like this one, I'm kind of glad I'm not teaching anymore with this election. Um, but um, the ninth graders, you can hear their, their parents when they talk about who their political um, preferences are. And Leroy's like that too. My father says this and father says that. But as he grows older, he has his own opinions and develops his own political ideas and actually gets apologetic for disagreeing with his father on occasion. Uh, he's happy about secessionists first. Both of them were. Um, he mocked Lincoln and the Northern soldiers, which is common. Uh, if anybody has ever seen the World War II cartoons drawn by uh, Dr. Seuss, um, you'll know what I mean. They are, they, Dr. Seuss picked up on every racial, um, ethnic uh, idiosyncrasy he could find and really exploited them. And the kids were just astounded because as one of them said, Miss Croon, this is not one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And it's pretty, pretty rough stuff. But political cartooning during wartime will be like that. And he, to give you an example, in the book, we have um, a drawing by Leroy where it's um, a little short man shoots, pointing a very big gun at somebody with a stovepipe hat and a beard. So you can pretty much imagine who that was. And we put that we put that in there as one of his drawings and a lot of his um, little margin notes, um, some of the math problems he was doing, all just the little things that um, teenagers today still do. I could tell you who his first crush is, but I won't tell you, but I, I know who his first crush was. Um, so the war starts and Leroy spent four years recording the course of the entire war. He was interested in all of it, not just the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, my students used to think when we would get it, talk about the Civil War, there were only two generals, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses Grant. I said, no, that's not quite right. Um, and even living in Northern Virginia, as I do, um, they didn't realize that there was another whole section of the war in the Tennessee, Army of the Tennessee, and even across the Mississippi. They had no idea about that. Leroy follows the Navy. He knows the names of the, of the blockade runners. Um, he writes about everything. So if you know nothing about the Civil War, you'll learn along with the people um, like Leroy did. Like for example, here, um, I took a clip from his diary. It's called the Battle of Richmond. If you read into it, it's actually, um, um, the, the seven days battles. There's no real battle of Richmond. Um, I live um, in the DC suburbs, not very far from Leesburg, and he writes about the battle of Leesburg. Well, it's not known as that. It's the battle of Ball's Bluff, writes about that one. Um, so that's what the footnotes will do. We'll, we'll give you additional information correct some of the mistakes that he gets from the newspapers and um, let you know what the names of the battles are, especially when there's more than one name. Um, he gets news from his father, from the newspapers, magazines, um, and from other adults. He especially prized letters from his uncles. He had like six uncles that were in, in the military, different positions. Um, he really prized hearing those letters or being able to read them because they were at the front. They really knew what was happening. 
Um, so he's interested in how Georgia's troops were doing. As I said, Macon became a training ground. And so he kept up with the units that had been there to train. Um, and he, he would follow them at the, the seat of war, which is what they called the front. Um, he has percept perceptible mood swings um, in his diaries um, as the South wins and loses. This is really particularly ev um, evident um, when he's talking about the Mississippi battles. Um, Sherman and the Georgia campaign are well covered. Um, Macon came close. There wasn't a whole lot of real fighting. That it wasn't part of Sherman's march to the sea. It's a little bit south of that. But he did send Stoneman's cavalry to try and liberate um, Andersonville. And they got st uh, stuck in Macon. Uh, there was one cannonball that came into the, um, the neighborhood. It, it bounced in the front yard, went through the colonnade, and then into the, the parlor at one of the homes as the lady of the house was coming down the stairs. Leroy notes that they left town the next day. Um, but he was able to see that happening from the, the roof. He could, he could watch it. It's as close as he got. Stoneman, by the way, he um, ended up um, surrendering all of his cavalry at Macon. He was not able to make it through. Um, Leroy's father was part of the home guard. He was fighting. Thomas was already gone in, in the military. So it was it, it's interesting to to see him kind of um, adjust to all this happening right outside. He's so excited and scared at the same time. Uh, processing the news was one of the things that we found was really, really interesting. Um, some of the, um, my writing colleagues who write for Savas Baby, who, who read the beginning of the book um, as we started, they, they, they said they don't often think about that when they're writing their um, their book on the peach, on the peach orchard, or about a specific general. Um, they don't think about what the families are going through. But Leroy lets us know in real depth what happens. Um, he learns not to trust everything that he reads. Um, he at first he does believe everything, but then he realizes that's not exactly the case. His hopes get really high, and then they're dashed. And he learns that he's got to wait for general orders to come out before he can really find out the truth. Um, he knew, learns the news is often wrong. He learns to wait. He finds out that there is um, fake news out there. Um, and one of the examples I pulled for you is this one, uh, this excerpt. It's dated Tuesday, July 7th, 1863. And Mr. Clisby, who was the editor of the Macon Daily, was at the house frequently. Again, his father's prominent. So Mr. Clisby had come to the house and Leroy knew that Yarry Northern Virginia had crossed the Potomac for a second time. And he wanted to know if Mr. Clisby had heard of anything, if there'd been a, a battle or a skirmish. And Mr. Clisby said yes, that they had heard about something. And Leroy writes, Mr. Clisby thinks it was not a large affair which was, he was talking about Gettysburg. And the battle had been over for four days. So even with Telegraph, they still hadn't got the news about uh, how bad Gettysburg had been. After this, it's all he writes about for a few days and tries to find out who, who died there, um, who didn't. The newsprint here, um, Clisby would sometimes pull Northern accounts of what had happened. This was a clipping that was in Leroy's um, diary. Um, it's actually from the New York Herald of the 13th. It talks about Grant's losses. So it's, it's interesting if they needed to fill space, they'd use Northern reports. Um, so the diary allows us to see how civilians process this news. Um, he had a couple of um, two uncles who were killed in the um, in the Western theater of war. They both lived in Texas, but they, they were killed there. Um, it, one of his favorite uncles was um, 
shot and injured at Second Manassas. Another, um, it was a family member, kind of distant by marriage family member, was killed at Sharpsburg or Antietam. Um, and he learned about people from the family who had gone to Gettysburg as well. Um, so it's, it's real interesting how they do that. One of his uncles, who's only nine years older than he was, um, was captured and was a prisoner of war. So you watch the family try and figure out where is he? Is he alive? Is he not? Okay, he ended up at Rock Island prisoner of war camp. Can we get food to him? Can, can, does he have enough clothes? They're trying to figure out all this information. So you're able to see what that felt like to a family. Um, slavery, of course, is part of it. Um, these are stock photographs. Um, I don't have any of the family that I'm able to use. I have some of the, uh, one uh, woman in particular, but I was told by the people who owned it that I couldn't use it. So a, 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 it's a, a real shame, but um, according to the 1860 census, there were 93 slaves on the Gresham plantations and seven in their household. Um, the, their, the census had two parts, Schedule A, which is white people and free blacks, and Schedule B, which are um, enslaved population. Uh, Schedule B will give you the, um, the gender, the age, um, and degree of color of um, a slave. No name, no occupation which you would find for the white people. So I, that's why I can tell you there are 93 slaves, um, but I don't know all their names. So Leroy mentions them as they come up. So we get a sense of some of them. Um, a couple were um, some skilled carpenters, blacksmiths, other people who came up. Uh, we get to know everybody in the Macon household, all seven, and can figure out which one is basically which age um, based on the uh, descriptions of the people. Um, he's very fond of these people. Uh, they're, they're a part of family. Uh, Julia Ann, for example, that's just a regular sentence, um, but he put a lot of effort into writing her name, so there's got to be affection there. Um, he mentions many of them. Um, the um, kitchen, the, the, the woman who worked in the kitchen and did the cooking was Mary. She would occasionally have the children all come in and they would have a candy pull, do a taffy pull, something like that, or bake their favorite cookies. Um, um, the man who was basically the, uh, in charge of maintaining the house, I can see Leroy following him around asking all kinds of questions. Uh, he taught Leroy how to grow cantaloupe, which was his favorite fruit. So Leroy that year was in charge of all the cantaloupe. Um, so he describes how the plantation and the home in town support one another. Um, he would talk about the crops coming up, which, which is where the wealth of the family was. And uh, at first he talks about cotton. Second half of the war, he's talking about hogs, how many hogs they slaughtered each year. That became money. Um, the, the family in town would support the people on the plantations by making sure, you know, there was an overseer. Uh, but also when they got ill, taking care of them. He talks about um, one of the other housemaids being spirited out of the house in the middle of the night with a lot of commotion. And it, the next day he found out that the family had discovered that her sister down in Houston was dying and they wanted her to be able to say goodbye before her sister passed. And so they rushed her out of the house to get her there as fast as they could. Um, the, um, the government would um, conscript, I'll put that in air quotes, um, one-tenth of the slave population. So at one point, there were seven of the um, plantation men from the, make, from the Gresham's plantations that had to go to Savannah to build, build battlements. Uh, for the Confederacy. And when they come back, they're all sick. And Leroy's concerned uh, about one in particular that the family keeps in their home until he's well enough to go back. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see this um, real intricate relationship. Um, 
he doesn't really talk about slavery, but again, he's born into this life. He's, he's raised, as the one picture in the middle shows, he's raised by these people. Um, he didn't know anything else. And even one letter we have um, from his father, his father was writing to the, his mother, and he said that he was down in the fields and the, the people were working so hard and he felt really horrible because it was very, very wet and he was having a hard time getting around on his horse. And th these people were working and they didn't have a horse. And he writes, it makes me almost wish I didn't own a slave. And, and after that, you can kind of hear him saying, I don't know what else we could do. I don't know what other options there are for me other than this system that they were born into. Um, the only thing that he talks about, about um, the ending of slavery is that he agrees with his father that um, emancipation should be done gradually. And that's basically all he does say about it. Again, he, his health was very much failing at that point. Um, he was terminally ill. He didn't know this though. His parents didn't tell him, which I can kind of understand. They wanted his, their son to stay with them. Um, and at the, because he didn't know what he had, I didn't, I didn't know what he had. As I'm working through this, I get to the end of the transcription and he's died and I still can't tell my publisher what killed him. So Ted had one of his other authors who is a Johns Hopkins trained surgeon read through just the medical portions where he talks about the treatments, how he felt, um, the medications he was given, and some of them are kind of scary. Um, and two weeks later, um, the doctor gets back to Ted and says, I know what it is that, that he died from. Um, he told us that 70% of people in this time period carried the disease that killed Leroy, but their, their constitutions, their bodies were strong enough to suppress it. Um, so they would be, as in terms as we would call today, they'd be asymptomatic. They'd have it, but they wouldn't show it. Um, Leroy was terminally ill with a rare form of tuberculosis. And the picture in the middle is a drawing from um, the dissertation by the man named Pot. Um, it's showing what Pot's disease or spinal tuberculosis, how it would degrade the bone in the vertebrae in the back. So this one, you wouldn't be hunched over like, um, you know, at the shoulders, like we see older people. You would have a bump maybe in the middle of your back. And um, the, I'd never heard of Pott's disease. Uh, the only people I know who have heard of Pott's disease are medical people. Um, and it still exists in some parts of the th what we used to call the third world. Um, I have a, a doctor who is from Pakistan and he says, Oh yes, in the poorer parts of his country, uh, people who cannot afford to get medical care or cannot physically get to medical care, you'll see people with POTS disease, um, which I just, you know, we've got such good medical care here. You don't think about things like, like tuberculosis anymore, but it was very prevalent. And he writes about his symptoms, the remedies, the pain he feels, the treatments, including getting those what he thought were, what the, the um, Washington Post editor thought, writer thought were bed sores. The abscesses had to be lanced at one point. And he writes about that. Um, and we found out that this is the only detailed tuberculosis account written by a patient in the 19th century who doesn't know his disease. So then you get, you know, you're not looking for a benchmark. Oh, I've got two months to go now. Um, so it's really kind of a pure account of having tuberculosis. So it's important for medical students. Um, the decline, as one person um, at an Ohio Civil War roundtable told me, said Shakespeare couldn't have written a more perfect tragedy than this lot, real story. Um, the eventual Southern defeat depresses Leroy and he writes about this and he is declining at the same time. Um, 1865 arrives and he is taking more morphine, growing weaker and the pain is getting worse. 
Um, his left leg originally was the one that was injured as a, when he was younger. His right leg, he, he's starting to lose his ability to use the right leg. And again, if you see a spine that is contorted like that in the picture, you can kind of understand it. But he is taking uh, morphine, um, all kinds of, of medications. Some of them are, are, are rather weak. You figure, why are you taking lavender tea? Um, but other things that have mercury in them, all kinds of things. Again, he became more concerned about his good leg. And he writes at one point, he says, my left leg has always been a problem for years. Now my good leg, my right leg is going. Pretty soon I'm gonna be without any leg to stand upon at all. So his, his sense of humor is shining through here even at the same time. And journaling seemed to take his mind off the disease. It became very important. And as I'm reading the, the transcripts and they were, I haven't actually seen these diaries, they're digitized. I'd have to get some sort of special dispensation to go back there. I know the curator and I'm working on her, but it hasn't worked out yet. Um, so it was, it was good, but I noticed the handwriting began to change. It wasn't Leroy's anymore. And I'm like, huh, whose is that? So I went through some of the extant letters that we have, including the one here. Uh, it wasn't his father's handwriting because that was big and bold and he always used bright blue ink. Um, we figured out that it was his mother's handwriting. She was taking dictation. The last complete uh, diary entry written completely by Leroy was May um, 22nd, 23rd, 1865. And the entry, the very last one, was written on June 8th, 1865. And it says, I am, and then we couldn't read the last word. It, was, it wasn't smudged, it just was like the pen was lifting up away from the paper. And if you look at this example here, you see some parts where it's darker, some parts where it's very light. And that's the way his mother's handwriting went. Um, we figured out eventually using some of Ted's um, um, computer graphics programs, we were able to, to read behind it and find out it says, I am perhaps. Um, and if you look at the context, he probably figured out he was dying at that point. Um, he did die 10 days later on the 18th. Um, this letter here um, was heartbreaking. It's Mary writing to her sister. She has all these brothers and one sister. And you get the, the details on what happened in those last 10 days, um, what his disease progress was, the things he said, um, the reaction of people. You get a, a, an idea of what reconstruction is going to look like for the South, what the burial was like, um all the all the processes that went along with with that as well you find out that the only people who ever treated his wounds were his mother his father his grandmother or his brother none of the slaves were were expected to take care of him um they all did the physical stuff and it was it wasn't pleasant either um he she writes about the fact that he got angry at one point. You would think if you're dying and you figured it out, you'd be pretty angry the whole time. And it, it wasn't angry. He wasn't mad at God. He had a lot of faith. This is a Presbyterian family. Um, when he, he writes on Sundays, he always writes about the religious texts that he's reading. Um, he gets mad because his mother didn't tell him with enough time for him to give his private possessions to the people he wanted to have them. Which is why his sister's family had the diaries. Leroy's diaries went to his sister, Minnie. He had a scrapbook that may have gone to his brother, Thomas, or may have gone to his, his um, one of his cousins who was close in age. Um, but he was angry because he couldn't do all of that in person. Not everybody was in town. Um, he, she did say that he kept asking to have 
just some time with no pain. He had a full day with no pain the day before he died. And he talked, she talks about um, all the things about him that they missed. Um, so he's chronicling the decline of the old South, which paralleled his own death. Um, he writes very briefly about Lincoln's assassination. Again, like the, the media often was, a lot of it was wrong. Uh, it, it didn't happen at the opera. Um, other things that were incorrect about it. So um, his gift to history, it's the only non-combatant account of the Civil War. Um, it's the only insider view of a prominent Southern family during the war. Uh, if you've ever read Mary Chestnut's um, diary. It's incredibly interesting. Um, um, to give you one example, one of the medications that they use, kind of like we use Tylenol, it's a compound called Dover's powder. And you take a little bit and put it in, a, it, sprinkle it in something to drink and you would drink it. And um, it was half syrup of, uh, the dried compound of syrup of Ipecac and morphine. And you'd only take a little bit of it. And you read in Mary Chestnut's diary that her, um, her, her attendant actually put a whole packet of it in a glass of wine. Mary Chestnut was out for days. But they, uh, something you had to be very careful with, you know, playing around with morphine. Um, it was something that was developed during the Revolutionary War and it was sold in India as late as the 1980s. It's not sold anymore. But um, you get a, a real good um, look at what it was like. Um, and it's the only detailed diary on the course and treatment in the 19th century of tuberculosis. Uh, Dennis Rosbach was the doctor who helped us. And he put together um, a small book, smaller book, um, about um, the treatments, why they were used, um, how the treatment changed for tuberculosis over time. So it's more focused on the disease than it is on Leroy. And um, that's the companion book. Um, so at the, while we're working on this, Ted's asking me to you know, find other diary examples. And I've been looking, I've read several, I've done research on John Mosby. I, I live in Mosby's Confederacy area. I've done a lot of reading on Jeb Stewart. Um, I've read some others. Um, the only one I could think of and I had to explain it to Ted was the diary of Anne Frank. It's the only thing that was similar. Now there's very, it's, they're very different. Um, but we kind of look at Leroy as the young voice of the Southern Confederacy um, as we look at Anne Frank as the young voice of World War II. Uh, she is writing, she's, um, hiding in, in an attic, um, trying to keep from being um, killed by another government because of her religion, because she's Jewish. Um, Leroy is kind of removed from society as well, but not because you know any enemy is about to get him, but he's got a disease that's killing him. Um, they're both incredibly eloquent. They write from their heart. Um, they give you a lot of detail about their lives. You feel like you're in their lives. Um, and that those, that's how they're, they're alike. Okay. Um, so that is Leroy and his story. Um, I've got two daughters of my own. My younger daughter says Leroy is the third child I never had. Um, and um, he's just a delight to get to know. And the, the ending is, is very, very sad. But um, it's a worthwhile book. I actually had, a, um, I'm in a, a reading group. And um, we're reading uh, Wilkie Collins, A Woman in White, which Leroy had read. And so I'm excited to be able to read one of the books that he, he had read. So I can kind of see that. And I mentioned that to the ladies in the group and a couple of them wanted to know, oh, that's interesting. Would my, my sixth grade son is going to be studying the Civil War. Would this book be good for him? I said, well, yeah, I think it would be because of someone his age. 
he'll be able to make a connection. Um, so um, a friend and I have put together a curriculum guide. Um, she teaches middle school English in New Hampshire. I taught um, upper level high school history in Virginia. We blended our, our curriculum standards. And so there's also a set of um, curriculum out there that people can use that want to teach. So that is my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, that was so absolutely captivating and we are looking forward to hearing the questions that people have and we'll get to those in just a second. Um, before we get to the questions, um, you guys take just a few seconds to go ahead and if you haven't already entered your questions in the chat box, you can go ahead and do that. Um, while we, uh, while Mike talks, first I'm going to introduce Mike Kendra. He is the owner of CivilWarTalk.com. And Jan, while, we're, while Mike's talking, we'll let people enter their questions because I know if they were like me, they were so interested in the presentation, maybe they didn't type those questions in. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Ms. Kroon. That was great. I appreciate for your presiding, uh, providing that presentation tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Kendra. I'm the owner of Civil War Talk tonight. Uh, Civil War Talk's hosting Janet Elizabeth Kroon, our guest presenter on Zoom. And this is a great opportunity to learn about another great piece of American history. Uh, if you're the author of a great, uh, a great Civil War book or a battlefield guide or a researcher or a collector and you have a story to tell, we'd love to speak with you about providing a presentation like the one we did tonight. Uh, if you're an author and you might be concerned that uh, maybe a Zoom presentation is more than you can handle, then perhaps you might consider a book launch. And actually, I can even give you uh, an example of what maybe uh, uh, you might be looking for. Uh, actually, this is Civil War Talk. I'm uh, sharing my screen right now. And you can see here, uh, here's the presentation that we did tonight and a couple other articles that are featured. And uh, you can scroll down here and see uh, that there's other things on here. We have articles and all different kinds of things. And I even ha I have here uh, a new section called uh, Favorite Civil War Books and Movies. And if you scroll down through here, you'll see there's all different kinds of books. And if you scroll down far enough, you'll find like uh, even tonight's book, tonight's books in this uh, list here, The War Outside My Window. I encourage everybody that's on tonight's, uh, tonight's chat to go ahead and go there. And uh, if you like this book, go ahead and click on it and say that it's uh, one of your favorites by clicking on this little up arrow and vote for it and uh, bring it to the top of the list as one of the most popular books. Uh, and you can do that for any of the books in here. But, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, talk to us about a book lunch. You can go ahead and have a, a, a book layout just like this uh, where you can go ahead and buy the book and uh, it gives a synopsis about the book, things like that. Uh, but Civil War Talk's got like kind of an interactive website that's got uh, you know, thousands of uh, different posts uh, and we got uh, lots and lots of different members and uh, you can partner with us and we can do a social media campaign and uh, we have all different kinds of uh, programs and presentations that we can uh, talk about doing. Uh, but we have lots of historians, reenactors, and students on the website. And I'd even see, say fanatics about the American Civil War. And many of us don't just read a story or two about the Civil War. We live and love to learn about the era. It's our passion. So um, uh, let's see. Today, we've grown into a modern community. We've got 24,000 members. Uh, so that's uh, lots and lots of members and 115,000 different discussions about the war between the states. And membership in our community has always been free and it's really easy to join too. So I wanna invite everybody to join our community today. And if you haven't already, you'll find stories that you'll cherish and you'll find knowledge that'll thrill, challenge and enlighten you. And you'll find friends that'll last a lifetime. So join Civil War Talk tonight and we hope to see you all in our community soon. And now it's Laura's cue. There you go. Yes. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, and we do have over 24,000 members and over 15,000 threads. And I noticed today that we're pushing 116,000 threads. So I'm going to have to change the slide for the next, oh, no. the next presentation. Um, so, Ms. Kroon, if you're ready, let's get to those questions. Um, if you haven't already entered your question in the chat, if you want to go ahead and do that, uh, we will take the questions in the order that they are um, listed there in the chat. 
So let me get the questions for you and we will get started. Uh, let's see. First up, we have, all right, uh, Leroy seemed advanced. This is from someone who's read the book. This is Tina. Uh, Leroy seemed very advanced in understanding about the way the war was going. However, what do you think made him think, along with most Southerners, that the war would last for years, as he thought in 1864? Probably because um, things seem to be at a standstill. 1864 is when you have um, things are stalled around uh, Richmond and things are stalled around um, Atlanta for a while and in um, Tennessee. And so they, you know, the will was there still. Uh, so they, they thought, well, you know, what, we still want to fight this. We still want to win this. We still want to be an independent country. Uh, and they just weren't sure about the, the ability of the North to overcome that. So I think I think that that's the reason why. So if that makes sense. They just weren't seeing any progress. It would go back and forth and back and forth. So you have Gettysburg, which people call a turning point, but the war still goes on for two more years. Um, right. Good um, question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, this is from Paul. He said, I noticed that you hate, it. we're all fascinated with the Young Readers Edition and Curriculum Guide, and Paul wants to know, when did that idea come to you that this would be a perfect text for classrooms? Actually, um, it came to me when I saw the Facebook post about the article. Um, so yes, I met Leroy on Facebook. Um, I have always taught with primary sources, and um, I have found that kids will respond better to curriculum if they think it matters to them, if that makes sense, if they can make a contact with it. And so someone who is their age, you know, 12 to 17, they can say, oh, that kid is like me. Um, and actually today, the, the woman that I was speaking with, I asked her, does her son like chess? Because Leroy is, is just, I mean, he is a, excellent chess player and she said oh yes both my boys do and I said well they will love this then because he is a very um, eloquent chess player um, so if they can relate to that that will that will get them interested in the other material so um, and it, it is good because he goes throughout the entire war from beginning to end you don't miss anything. So that, that's why I think it would be really good to be in classrooms. I, think, I, I agree. And I think, I think that your point about making a connection with the uh, characters in a book is so important for young people and mm -hmm. uh, that this people would be able to relate to Leroy. Um, uh, someone asked, did Tom, uh, Thomas enlisted pretty late? Or did he, was he conscripted or how did he wind up in the army? He ended up, um, his father tried his best to keep him out. Um, he sent him to um, Milledgeville to college. Um, and at one point, Leroy's, right, I almost, almost missed it. He's writing about father going to visit Thomas and he brings them ground, ground peas or Japanese nuts. Uh, some bacon, some this and that, uh, um, uh, a, cons a conscript, and then a few other things. It's, it's, oh, he bought him a conscript. That's how we got him out, was by paying somebody else to fight for him. And then in 1864, the Confederacy outlawed that and said everybody had to go. So he first um, was in um, a local, like a home guard unit, and then he was pulled into the, the regular army, although his father was still able to pull strings and get him safer assignments. That's how powerful his father was. But um, So he paid a substitute um, to yes. take his place until the, that was not uh, allowed anymore by, by the conscription laws. Right. I see. Um, so okay, he got so out Paul, of it as far as he could. <laughs> Yeah, as long as he could, right? Yep. For as long as he could. Yep. Um, so let's see. Um, 
here's Paul's question. He says, um, forgive me because I haven't read the book yet, but did Leroy write about receiving correspondence from the front or did he have someone that he would write to? I suppose that would be his brother. And was he active, as active as he was to receive news, it struck me that he might make the attempt to have a regular correspondence with someone. He wrote to his, um, his uncles, the two in particular he was close to, Uncle Edge, his name was Edgeworth Bird. Um, he wrote to Uncle Edge and he wrote to um, um, the other, the other one who, uh, who ended up in the um, prisoner of war camp. Um, he wrote to those two in particular on a regular, relatively regular basis. And of course he wrote to, to Thomas as well. Uh, and the family would pass letters around. Um, grandmother would get a letter and then she would send it on to somebody else to read. So they would kind of pass them around. Um, so you got a little bit of, of everything in there. But um, that's how we got a lot of that information. How was Leroy educated? Um, as did he, you said that his leg was injured when pretty early on. So with those disabilities, did he attend school with other children or was he homeschooled or? He, he attended governance? with other kids for a while. And it seems like from some of the, the early letters, um, you know, reading back to finding out when, you know, they started mentioning his illness in letters, he was about eight years old and he went to school initially with other kids. And his father wrote at one point that um, he had to remind Leroy, don't go sliding on the ice and, and things like that. He had to be very, very careful. And then it just got to be too much. You know, the leg was crushed. Um, and then the tuberculosis started taking advantage of his compromised system. Then they had to keep him away from other people. Um, he writes about when his sister, and he, Again, this, this young, Minnie was a, an author as an adult in her own right. Um, and she was asked as a junior in, in, at Wesleyan to read her junior essay in front of people. And for a young girl um, in, in that social strata, that was the only time in her life she was allowed to have a serious opinion. Now, afterwards, after she got out of school, wasn't a school girl anymore then, it was off to the marriage market, and you're not supposed to have your own opinion. Um, but this time, she could. And Leroy talked about her writing process, going with her to buy pencils and how expensive they'd gotten. And um, then he talks about going to listen to her read, and all the slaves had gone, and they were sitting in the, the auditorium, and the whole community is there. And he's outside listening. And I'm like, why is he outside listening? Because I hadn't found out why he had, you know, his illness was yet. So his parents knew, they knew to keep him from home. He was able to um, teach himself like he does with the mathematics, um, reading the Shakespeare. He, he knew Latin. He, I had a, a, one of our Latin teachers um, at my high school, um, I asked her if she would be willing to, to work with the Latin. And she, she said at one point, I, I, I have all of it except one, it doesn't quite make sense. It might be an older version of Latin. I'm thinking there's an older version of Latin. You know, I didn't quite get that. But um, I said, but it helped to know that he likes to play with words. And she goes, yes, now it makes sense. He plays with words in Latin. That's how bright this kid is. Um, so being self-educated and reading everything he could get his hands on, I think is helped, what helped make him so, so brilliant and so unique. You know, kids that read de tend to be very, do well in school. Yeah, sounds like he was reading some advanced material too. You said he read Shakespeare for fun, so. Yeah, he was um, reading Shakespeare. It was just, I'm like, okay, wow. <laughs> So you mentioned um, the situation with the enslaved people um, and the family's relationship with them. Have you um, researched to find out if Leroy's father or mother perhaps inherited those enslaved people or if, how, how they came to be in the family? And do you know if it was it still um, illegal or required congressional approval to free uh, enslaved people in Georgia at that time? 
That's a good question. And I will have to look into that. Um, um, I believe it was really expensive to do that. Um, he, his father inherited some of the slaves from his father. Um, the older brother, Edmund, got the plantation. John had already moved to Macon, so they split the slaves in half. Um, I found when I was working on the curriculum guide a, a, a book, interestingly enough, about desegregation in Boston. And it, it used the Gresham family as, as a case study and talked about their sla the slaves that Edmund had. Um, I've tried to find out um, what happened with some of them, but haven't, got, haven't gotten any luck. I'm going to have to spend some time in, in Macon at the library. Um, the librarian there is, is wonderful. So she was very helpful with the maps uh, to find out what happened to them. Um, I do oh, know that a, one of the slaves, and they had a couple who ran off and they get caught and brought back. Uh, one ran off and he, he wrote to his mother on the plantation. So they allowed their slaves to be literate, which was elite. Eagle, um, because the two the maids would write back and forth between um, the Greshams and uh, grandmother in Athens. Um, but he they all assumed that he'd ran away with the Yankees, but he actually was working for a doctor um, attached to the Army of Northern Virginia. So he ran away to the Confederate Army, which was really interesting. So um, there's a lot in there where he mentions one or two sentences and then you've got to research more to get, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah. well, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Um, so John would like to know, did Leroy have an opinion on General Forrest and, and also did Thomas survive the war? I think he said he did. Thomas did survive the war. Um, he had, um, two sons. He married this um, young lady named Tallulah Billups after, uh, about four or five years after the war. Um, they had two children together and she died of tuberculosis. Um, she and her mother are buried in the Gresham plot at Rose Hill. Um, and she's got a very elaborate grave. He must have been just devastated by it. Uh, so he did survive. He became um, an attorney. Um, I forgot half, the other half of the question. I'm sorry. Did he have an opinion on Forrest, General Forrest? Oh, yeah, he did. He thought Forrest was wonderful. He did. That, he, it wasn't his favorite general. I won't tell you who that is. Uh, it wasn't Lee. He thought General Lee was, was magnificent as well. Um, he, he wrote about how he felt when both Stonewall Jackson and, and um, when Jeb Stewart were killed, but he thought um, Forrest was, was wonderful. Talked about the things that he did. So. I'll have to read the book to find out who his favorite general was now. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, Roy <laughs> said, Roy had a great question. In putting this book together, what was maybe the most exciting discovery or aha moment that stands out to you? Wow, that is a great question. The easy one is finding out um, who some of the names were, being able to put the family together. Um, that, was, that was some of the interesting stuff. Um, finding out that he's, you know, related a couple of different ways to significant people you read about. Um, um, TRR, um, oh, oh. Cobb. Cobb. Thomas Reed Reed. They, they Cobb. knew the Cobbs. They knew the Cobbs. Um, so he talked, you know, cause grandmother lived in, in Athens as well. And, and I've seen, I've seen his grave in Athens. And um, he wrote, she wrote about how, how big it was and well attended. And um, he was also um, um, the two door brothers, Edward, Edward Dorr was a relation by marriage. 
he was killed in the in the Mississippi area, and um, so that was that was really rough, um, knowing that that happened. Um, so being able to make those really personal connections, um, I found really interesting. Um, there's 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 some really crazy silly things in there um, that just make you laugh. Um, um, some of the things I think one of the funniest things for me because I I taught in Fairfax County, um, so I'm very familiar with the old town part of Fairfax. And he, he wrote about the first incursion by the Union into Fairfax City, as they called it, Fairfax Courthouse. And it was just depressed to see how the South was um, holding the city, because it was kind of a, a, a big place to have Fairfax Courthouse. And uh, so he writes what the newspapers basically said. He says, ah, I know how Lincoln's uh, putting together his army now. They're kicking everybody out of the saloons, giving the drunkards guns and sending them loose on the women and children of Fairfax Courthouse. So it's things like that that, that are amusing to you. You know they're not true, but, but they're, they're amusing. So there's a lot of interesting things in here. Roy, I think you're gonna have to read the book. Yeah, I find new things. <laughs> that was a great question, though. It. <laughs> yeah, it was a great question. Um, yeah. Let's see, Marie would like to know, um, did Leroy have friends that stayed close or was he insulated to his family? He did have friends. He had um, uh, a couple of friends that played chess together. Um, and he, um, they would, they, he talked one time about these two boys coming to pick him up and put him in his wagon and they went literally around the corner to Mrs. Whittle's house. And Mrs. Whittle is a, a society lady. And you hear about Mrs. Whittle giving parties to everybody, you know, big, big important ones for the adults, but mostly she liked to give parties for the young people so they could learn how to behave at a, a big social situation. And she gave parties for the black people in town which I'd love to know more about as well. Um, and it, it, he was, thought he was gonna be very bored going to Mrs. Whittle's house. And it turns out that she is an exceptional chess player. And she would play these three boys simultaneously and beat them all. And he said that his goal was to make her really work to beat him. And um, so it was a very big surprise. And he loved going to Mrs. Whittle's house after that. So. You get to know the whole the whole neighborhood. You yeah, know, all sounds people like. that they know um, this is probably the last question that we're going to have time for, so we're going to go ahead and share our screen again. But um, Gary Morgan is with us, and she, and she is the author of Andersonville Raiders, the Andersonville Raiders. And her question oh. is, it's an excellent title. Does it come from the diary? The War Outside My Window? Oh, we agonized over the title. It was, Ted said it was one of the hardest ones. Some of them um, do come right from the content of the book, but we wanted to find one. Originally, it was going to be Son of Georgia, but then people were saying, no, that's too specific, and you want people who are interested more than Georgia to, to read it. So we went through all sorts of different permutations of it. And then he said he just woke up one morning and there it was. And it, it, it's just right. Brilliant. Just right. The title is brilliant. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's good. And Ted it's designed the, uh, the cover. That's actually the house they lived in. Um, and then he put him behind that piece of shattered glass. Great cover. So. So thank you so much again, uh, Ms. Kroon, um, and, and for answering all the questions, for the presentation and for answering all the questions. You're very uh, welcome. Everything. The questions were great. Weren't they great? Yeah. Um, just a reminder for everybody on the program, all of our guests pr provide these presentations without compensation. So we'd encourage you to order the book, um, get your own copy, and in that vein, um, the War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860 to 1865 is available at Savas Beatty, the publisher, and they would like to thank folks for adapting to the current normal and for participating in the event tonight. 
when ordering Miss Croon's book through the www.savisbaity website, add the code at the checkout to receive 20% off your total purchase. Just load the book in your cart, shop for as many books as you'd like, and when you check out, enter the code that Tina's typing in the chat box now, all caps. Please use all caps. Um, and another Savas Beatty title related to the war outside my window that Miss Croon mentioned, I Am Perhaps Dying by author uh, Dr. Dennis Rossbach. There we go. Um, Dennis has also, he's the author of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the Petersburg Campaign. Um, you've probably heard of that book before, um, but this book is strictly the medical backstory of spinal tuberculosis hidden in the Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, and I can't wait to read it. I'm a, I, I enjoy all the medical um, history of the Civil War. Uh, Dr. Rossbach's book is also eligible for the 20% discount, and I'd like to encourage everyone to order both books. Just add them to your cart, enter the code that, Gina, that uh, Tina's typing in the box right now, all caps, to receive 20% off of your entire purchase. And I will type the code in there so that you guys have it right there at the end. And remember, it's all caps. Um, next week, we have... Here it is. Next week, um, our guest will be Lance Hurtigan uh, on his book, The Iron Brigade in Civil War and Memory, The Black Cats from Bull Run to Appomattox and Thereafter. Um, Lance will be with us at 8.30 next Wednesday. Uh, and I, he's looking forward to the program and so am I. Um, on the next Wednesday, we'll have Neil Chatelaine. Um, his book is Defending the Arteries of the Rebellion, Confederate Naval Operations. Um, and Jerry Wooten, who bailed me out on um, Sam Hood's program a couple of weeks ago will be here on October 28th, and that's actually um, almost the anniversary of the Battle of Johnsonville, so it's a great time for us to be hearing about the Union supply operations on the Tennessee River in the Battle of Johnsonville. Uh, Jerry Wooten on October 28th, Scott Mingus on November 4th. I'm sure you guys all know Scott from Civil War Talk um, from the website uh, message board forum. Um, Scott's a member there, and his program will be on his new book, Targeted Tracks, the Cumberland Valley Railroad in the Civil War. November 11th, Ron Kirkwood on the George Spangler Farm and the Battle of Gettysburg. That's another medical um, program. November 18th, this one's newly um, confirmed, newly scheduled and confirmed. Um, and it's Kim very good. I got to pre-read it. Oh, did it's you? Good. Yes, Great. I did. We just confirmed it the other day, so thank you so much for giving us your um, your uh, pre-read opinion. So um, mm -hmm. we just confirmed it the other day, and Ken will be with us on November 18th, America's Very History, Landmines in the Civil War. On December 2nd, Stephen Order will be with us, and his topic is Lincoln Takes Command, the Campaign to Seize Norfolk and the Destruction of the CSS Virginia, and his program will be A Week with Lincoln. So we're looking forward to hearing um, that program on December 9th, Christopher Loprofito on uh, the Civil War Letters of Surgeon James D. Benton of the 119th New York. And December 16th, newly confirmed. We just got this one uh, the other day. Um, December 16th, Bradley got freed with the maps of the Calvary and the Gettysburg campaign. Um, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with all of his books. He's got several. Um, and this is his newest one, right, Jan? It is, yes. I have to get my copy. I haven't gotten mine yet. Okay, great. I've got to, I've got well, to order it. <laughs> we'll come to the program and we'll be giving out a code for 20% 20%, 20 off. So when you purchase it, you can get a 20% discount from um, Savas Beatty. Um, and on December 30th, another anniversary uh, program will be, uh, we'll be hearing from John Corstein again and his program, if you missed it, on the CSS Virginia was fantastic and so entertaining and we will hear him on December 30th, John Corstein. But next week on Wednesday, again, it's Lance Hurtigan, um, the Iron Brigade in Civil War and Memory, the Black Cats from Bull Run to Appomattox. I hope you'll all join us then. Thanks for tuning in tonight and we'll see you next week at 8.30 p.m. Thank you so much, Ms. Crane, for joining us. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. We're having you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.
Good night. night. You guys be sure to order your book. I've entered it in twice. The I've put in a whole thing.